Good evening, everyone. Uh, what an amazing crowd on a really rotten weather night. <laughs> so uh, I welcome you all here this evening. My name is Pat Brown. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences here at UAS. Tonight we have an absolutely wonderful speaker. Uh, Michelle Ridgway is a lifelong Alaskan. She's been engaged in marine ecological research and exploration in the Bering Sea in the Gulf of Alaska for over 20 years. From coastal kelp forests to deep sea habitats, Michelle has examined the role of biogenic features in supporting the diversity and abundance of species in Alaskan uh, oceans and waters. She's a diver, submarine pilot, a remote uh, submersible operator. Michelle continues to probe the depths of Alaskan marine waters using cutting edge technology, the, uh, the visual stuff as well as other, through her private research and consulting firm, Oceanus Alaska. This, this program I think you're gonna find very interesting. It's gonna get you into a, uh, one of the least discovered habitats of the world. So I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Michelle Ridgway. This is being taped, and so one of the things I want to point out to you is when we get to the point where you'll need or you will want to ask questions, please wait till I can get the microphone to you so that we can record your question. Okay? And with that, we'll start. Go ahead, Michelle. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming in on a rough weather day. Feels like a Bering Sea day out there with the wind and storm going. Um, I, I want to speak with you um, this evening uh, about an expedition that I joined last year. I'm uh, just one of many, many people involved in what is a very large research project underway. Um, I'm really honored to be able to share the findings of the large group that's, that's uh, involved in this work in the Bering Sea. And so what I'm first going to do is walk through uh, some basic geography, show you where, we're, where our work was conducted, uh, then talk about the food web in the Bering Sea, a little bit of oceanography, and then, because it's so very important for why this area is so special, we'll delve a little bit into geology of the area, um, including the formation of the canyons. We'll step back a little bit into um, post-Cold War, War, War era research. And then we'll jump back a few million years through the Ice Ages and then look at how these canyons have taken shape subsequent to that time. And then we'll plunge in in a little submarine and go exploring. Um, so with that, I'll um, ask for lights down and get started. <clears throat> Exploration of undersea canyons in the Bering Sea. Mostly I'll be speaking this evening about the largest canyon in the world, Zemchug Canyon. I'll also be speaking with you about Pribilof Canyon, located just south of the Pribilof Islands. All right, the Bering Sea, one of my favorite places, uh, bounded to the west by the Siberia, Russia, the north, uh, Bering Strait, of course, on the eastern coast, Alaska, and to the south by the Aleutian Archipelago. Uh, Bering Sea is 2.2 million square kilometers, and about half of that expanse is very shallow water, less than 200 meters deep. This is the Bering Sea shelf area. The other half, the Bering Sea, is quite deep. The Aleutian Basin is approaching 4,000 meters deep. So we have quite a transition from 200 to 4,000 meters. And the transition occurs right at this line, this line that roughly bisects the Bering Sea. It's called the, the shelf edge. It's also called the Beringian margin. And what you're looking at is the edge of the North American continent <clears throat> right here. This is where it has a, sort of a passive uh, connection with the Pacific Plate. Um, so along this edge, there are many deep sea canyons. Pribilof Canyon here, Pribilof Islands here, and this massive chasm is Zemchug Canyon. <clears throat> uh, this area, for, for those of you that haven't been to the Bering Sea, is approximately the same latitude as Juneau. We're at about 56 degrees north latitude here. And the area I'll be covering is up to about 58 degrees north latitude at the top edge of Zemchug Canyon. And we're at about 170 uh, degrees west longitude. 
The Bering Sea is an extraordinarily rich area, and part of the reason it is so incredibly rich is due to the oceanographic processes uh, that occur in this region. We have the uh, ocean water comes from the Pacific, and as most people know, the Pacific Ocean is a little bit higher than the Atlantic, so flow through the Pacific is pretty much south to north. And as part of that south to northward flow, we have the Alaska uh, current coming through. Current waters punch through the Aleutian Islands up into the uh, current that then hits this wall, this bearing uh, slope or shelf edge, and the current then becomes a sort of northwestward flowing bearing slope current. It is a very, very rich current for many reasons. As it flows along this shelf edge, deep, cold, nutrient rich waters, waters that are the highest, they're, they're neutrified with nitrogen and, and phosphorus, but the most important element, the rarest element or most unique element in here is is silicon. There's the highest concentration of silicon on the planet in the waters of the Solution Basin. These waters, the, the nutrients become entrained through sort of advective currents, upwelling, and a lot of water moving up through the canyons as the current passes along here, it gets little shots of nutrients, and that feeds um, the, the base of the food web in the Bering Sea. These currents continues to flow northwestward, forks, continues up through the Gulf of Anadir, and up in the Gulf of Anadir, this major current picks up another key uh, nutrient, iron. In fact, this is called uh, the Iron Curtain Effect. As iron is, flows down through the rivers in Russia uh, and, and neutrifies that ocean current, and then we have a lot of turbidity, a lot of mixing of currents as it's, the waters then squeeze through the Bering Strait on up into the Chukchi Sea and into the Arctic. And so effectively, this water has moved from the Pacific, become very enriched and lots of productivity occurring, squeezes through the Bering Strait, and carries on up and feeds the Arctic. <clears throat> Another major feature of this region, of course, is ice. Seasonal sea ice advances down to about this level from the north down to the south every season. Last year, we had an extraordinary ice event in the Bering Sea. Oddly, it was further south than it had been in nearly 30 years. The ice wasn't as thick, but on April 27th, of this year, I was standing here on St. George Island and stepped off onto sea ice, and I could have walked up to St. Paula and one of the other Pribilofs. So the ice, uh, the seasonal sea ice is a major force, not only in the productivity of the area, but as you'll see later, as well as the geology of, of that region. So for some of the students in the room, we'll talk briefly about primary production in the ocean. What are the main primary producers in the sea? Of course, phytoplankton. This area is so extraordinarily rich in phytoplankton production uh, and has this um, nickname, this Bering Slope or Bering Sea Green Belt. Again, as waters travel along the Bering uh, Slope, when the Bering Slope current and are enriched, there's explosive seasonal growth of phytoplankton in this area. Again, another pulse of growth as, it, as nutrients come off the land in Russia and from major rivers in, the, in, the, in Alaska. And you can see these hot spots this one in particular in the Chukchi Sea is, is um, the highest primary production for phytoplankton ever measured in the world. And I know that because I was on the ship 20 years ago measuring primary production in that region. Uh, it's never been surpassed. Um, not only annual punctuated uh, productivity, but also throughout the year, uh, throughout the summer season when it's ice free, the area continues to be productive because of those enriched currents flowing again on upward to feed the Arctic. From primary production as we work our way through the food web or simplified food chain, we have <clears throat> zooplankton, including some of the major species in that area, the Calinus and Neocalinus uh, copepods, euphausids or krill, uh, as well as pteropods and many other species um, of, of, um, of zooplankton. <clears throat> and they, in turn, are fed upon by myriad species of what we call forage fish. These are really important little fishes as well as squid. This one's a mctophid uh, or lantern fish, ex extremely rich in oils. It's so rich it's, it, for other organisms foraging in the Bering Sea, it's like eating butter. It is um, 
extraordinarily abundant and very important for everything that comes to the Bering Sea to feed. And many, many species travel long distances to the Bering Sea to forage every year, including the endangered short-tailed albatross. This photograph is taken right at Zemchug Canyon edge, a really important feeding area for the short-tailed albatross. All these birds are born on a single rock in Japan, Torishima Island. And their, their population was quite low, approaching about 1,000 birds. They're now rebuilding, a little over 2,000 birds. And approximately 80% of the adult population flies from Japan to the canyon edges to feed every year. It's a very, very important place for seabirds and many other species besides this, as well as uh, large mammals, fin whales, of course, the fur seals. We're right here near the Galapagos of the North, the Pribilof Islands, birthplace of many of the world's fur seals. Um, so these mothers with pups uh, rely on traveling to, um, to the canyon edges, to that shelf edge, to feed on the, on the rich uh, mectophids and other species there. And of course, what would be next in the food chain? Any of the students in the crowd? <clears throat> we've got predators. What kind of predators might we see in the Bering Sea? Well, we've got orcas. We also have sharks, and occasionally we have polar bears, of course, taking in uh, uh, mammals and birds and other large fishes in that environment. All right, so the food web is um, <clears throat> it's very short. Um, because there's such a punctuated sort of spring bloom and explosive growth in that area, everything comes into feed here, much like North Pass around Juneau um, in, in the summer season. Of course, another major predator in the system are, is us, humans. Uh, both international fleets in, in days past and now the U.S. fleet on the U.S. side alone takes nearly 2 million metric tons of fish products out of the Bering Sea on our side of the line alone. 2 million metric tons is quite a bit of production uh, to remove from this system that mostly is comprised of walleye pollock. We make surimi, fish sticks, and other products out of walleye pollock. There's also, of course, crab and other fin fish that comprise that ground, ground fish that we take out each year. Most of the productivity, though, production taken out of the Bering Sea is walleye pollock. Out of the 2 million metric tons for the last 20 years, about 1.5 million metric tons has been pollock. That's now uh, declining somewhat, and other species are being harvested more as pollock declines. And we're not the only nation that's focusing on the canyons and harvesting fish. The Russians uh, discovered these canyons over 50 years ago and fished their canyons as well as the U.S. side canyons very intensively. And in fact, it was commercial fishing that led initially to the discovery of these huge dark holes, these black holes out in the Bering Sea off the shelf edge, and no one knew quite what they were. Uh, they hadn't been fully characterized, but, but the fishing fleet knew quite well that they were extremely productive, and they focused a lot of their harvesting efforts in, in there for that reason. However, with the advent of World War II and uh, <clears throat> subsequent uh, anti-submarine warfare, there, there became a lot more interest in knowing exactly how large these holes were and exactly what they were. Um, not to mention where they were. So, that, so there became a much more intensive focus on mapping of, these, um, of the canyons along the shelf edge. Discussions among U.S. and Russian scientists intensified. Some of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, geologists from the U.S. side uh, communicated. You can see the Cyrillic on the top. This is a handwritten note from one of the USGS uh, geologists at that time. They kept trading notes with the Russians saying, well, what do you think it is? Well, when uh, we went in, the military went into full anti-submarine warfare mode, uh, then some of our geologists, both University of Alaska geologists as well as military um, and USGS geologists, were called to service to get out there and map these black holes and find out what they were. So two young men in particular were very eager to go out there. They were David Hopkins and David Scholl. Um, some of you may know Dave Hopkins. His story is chronicled in a book by Daniel O'Neill called The Last Giant of Beringia. Um, and very well-known geologist who, who um, joined Dave Scholl at sea for many, many months 
I went out surveying this area to try to sort out what, what kind of features these holes were. This is the originally published hand-drawn map. You can see at the top arrows pointing to Zemchug Canyon and Pribilof Canyon. And thanks to their many, many days at sea and tireless efforts, as well as those of their team, they, they were able to confirm that these were, in fact, canyons. <clears throat> this is the late Dave Hopkins, USGS and University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, professor. Um, he's sitting on what is now a dry portion of Beringia. Beringia, of course, is the Bering Sea land bridge. And he's looking out, contemplating, if those are canyons, how many they have formed? Of course, we all know what forms canyons on land. The canyons we're familiar with have what running through the bottom of them? Water, rivers, creeks, streams, some force to carve out the canyon shape. Um, so Dr. Hopkins being also quite knowledgeable about Beringia and thinking about this, decided to think back to what the world was like uh, over the last several million years. And this is sort of summarizes some of his contemplations as well as those of a team he worked with in the US as well as Russia. They thought, well, we have um, sea level high now, but back during glacial times, sea level was low. That's when the Beringia was dry, humans were walking across, other migrating mammals were walking across, presumably, and this was all dry. At that time, there may in fact have been rivers flowing out over uh, the land bridge, major rivers such as the Anadyr River from Russia and major rivers from Alaska. It's part of their contemplation. Let's see, we have um, <clears throat> get that one right. I want to show you a short video, but it's not uh, quite coming through here. Showing the um, ice retreat when Beringia was last exposed. No, looks like we lost it. Um, at any rate, approximately 21,000 years ago, ice began to melt and sea level began to rise. Uh, this, the last extent of ice was down to this edge, the edge of the North American continent to the Beringian margin approximately. And it slowly began to retreat. Um, ice retreated, sea level rose, and approximately 13,000 years ago, uh, the Bering Straits was breached and that was the end of at least dry land migration. After that, whether it was saber-toothed tiger or a human or a mastodon, you better be swimming or you're not going to make it across. Mm -hmm. Why is all of this important to understand this, the function of these canyons? Well, if in fact this were true, if these rivers had any role in carving these canyons, uh, then, then this area might have been, um, been the beach as this was dry land we have an estuary right there, and estuaries are very enriched areas. And that may have something to do with why these areas are rich today. Here is another hand drawing by geologists contemplating whether these rivers had any role in carving the canyons. They wanted to test their hypothesis, as pointed out in the earlier slides, that the, that the canyons were possibly carved out by the rivers. So the Russians and the US team sketched out their ideas, and then they went to sea. They went to sea for many, many months, taking transects across the Bering Sea. And what would they be looking for as they're crossing the Bering Sea? What kind of evidence might they have needed to determine whether, in fact, the rivers had any role in carving in the canyons? Well, they took what's called a sub-bottom profiler. And this is an instrument that pierces through the seawater column and then through the sea floor. And this is just one sample of the type of data they found. Very clearly, they found these gouges. They found these cut channels that have now been filled with sediment 
as clues uh, and, in fact, empirical evidence that rivers um, definitely flowed across Beringia. And after many, many um, maps were combined, they found that the rivers led right to the mouth of the canyon. And, in fact, that the Yukon River led directly to what is now Zemchug Canyon. And another major Alaskan river, the Kuskokwim, led to what is now Pribilof Canyon. There's another major feature of the Bering Sea I'm going to mention briefly. And it's very important for understanding what may be occurring out here now. We've talked about the, can the shelf edge. Now we're talking about the, the deep part of this region that's over 4,000, about 4,000 meters deep. And what I'm going to mention briefly is something found uh, by, uh, again, seismic work out in the Bering Sea in the 50s and 60s. And that's VAMP structures. VAMP stands for Velocity Amplitude Anomaly. And basically, there was a lot of survey work done in this area um, during the 50s and 60s and later in the 70s. And individuals found these very strange under the sea floor formations. These formations begin with petroleum. The gases from petroleum seep upward toward the sea floor. As, they, as gases rise, especially methane, it freezes due to pressure and temperature near the sea floor and forms these sort of dome-shaped formations. This is what it looks like from the seismograph. And what they are are quite likely methane hydrate plumes. Now we're trying to determine whether or not these, in fact, are seeping methane out into the system. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. This is methane hydrate. It's a water crystal bound uh, molecule of, of uh, methane. Yes, you can hold it. It burns as water is shed. <clears throat> it's not just one or two methane hydrate seeps identified in the Bering Sea. You can see from the map here, this is the entire basin. There's a huge number of them that were mapped many years ago. And this area has never been visited, so we don't know uh, whether they're seeping or bubbling. But we do have some clues, and we'll get to that in just a moment. All right, back to the canyons. Pribilof Canyon is huge, about 35 miles south of the Pribilof Islands, 1,830 meters deep. And Zemchug is also massive, 2,730 meters deep. But it's massive uh, in that its drainage area is 11,580 square kilometers. It is enormous. The volume of Zemchug Canyon is over 5,800 cubic kilometers. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge feature, not just for depth, but also for its, its sheer size. And by any metric, it's the largest undersea canyon on the planet. Here's a comparison with other canyons that you might be familiar with. On the far left, we have a cross section of a canyon pictured here in the upper corner. Grand Canyon. This is a cross section at its largest point. On the right hand side, you see the scale for depth in kilometers. Grand Canyon, nearly two kilometers deep. You may be familiar with an undersea canyon located off the coast of California, Monterey Canyon. It's been extensively studied by people at MBARI, um, Stanford, and Hopkins, through Hopkins Marine Station, and other research facilities that are located just at the head of this canyon. Again, this is a cross section of the largest portion of Monterey Canyon. And then here, this red outline is Zemchug Canyon. So you can see it is nearly three kilometers in depth and uh, a good bit larger than any canyon with which we are even remotely familiar. Here's another more modern view generated by Steve Lewis with NOAA of the canyons. These, these are the Pribilof Islands, St. Paul and St. George. And here's the butterfly-shaped Pribilof Canyon dropping down into the abyss. And here is Zemchug Canyon, also kind of butterfly or hammerhead shaped and dropping down about 2,700 meters to the point at which it then meets the floor of that Aleutian Basin much deeper, toward 4,000 meters. All right, now we'll get to mission. Last year, 33 of us uh, worked together in the field um, to examine several facets of these canyons. We wanted to explore, for the first time, these enormous features that we know are extraordinarily rich, and no one quite understands why. There's been decades of biological and oceanographic 
work done in this area, but we still really don't have a clear understanding of how those ecosystems function and why they're so much richer than any place on the planet. How much richer? Again, just that walleye pollock fishery alone is the largest single species fishery in the world. It's big, and very productive. We want to look at benthic and pelagic habitats as seafloor and water column habitats. We also, in particular, wanted to examine whether there were coral and sponge communities located within the canyons, do some basic mapping of where uh, biological organisms are, live within the canyons, examine biodiversity. We have some sampling, but again, uh, we really don't have a clear sense for what species even occur in the canyons, especially at the deeper depths. Uh, wanted to look at species associations. Who's living with whom? Are the, are the canyons particularly important? Do they have special habitats? And are those habitats really important for any creatures that we particularly care about, like crabs? like halibut, um, and we wanted to take a close look at those uh, associations. And in, in addition, uh, because the area has been fish for many, many decades, we wanted to see whether there was any evidence of humans having been there. And beyond that, we just wanted to check it out and go exploring. Um, again, there were 33 of us on board this vessel. It's a Polish-built, Russian-operated tug converted for research. It's a fantastic platform for working in the Bering Sea. It was a really excellent uh, ship for this particular mission. And the captain and crew of the research vessel Esperanza were, were just amazing. They put up with all kinds of challenges that the Bering Sea um, can serve up. Uh, there are many other people, including uh, individuals listed here, involved in launching uh, this mission. Uh, which was very expensive and took a tremendous amount of coordination. <clears throat> Our methods. All right. So you saw the mission. Now how do we do this? In situ transects. What is that? In situ means the in the water, in the natural habitat. We wanted to see how these creatures lived, where they lived, how they interact with one another, how they interact with these, this, these strangely shaped extraordinary canyons, we also wanted to see with our own eyes what is going on in the water column. Again, we have lots of plankton samples and other things that give us clues, but we wanted to see how it all plays out when you're actually in, in the environment. Um, and <clears throat> so we collected video, collected many, many specimens, uh, did quite a bit of mapping, and we'll get into um, highlights of some of our findings here in just a moment. But I want to focus first on why we would want to do in situ transects. So what's the, what's the big deal? Why would we want to go to all that effort? Well, much of our understanding of the deep sea is based on this type of sampling. This is a Van Dien grab of a dredge. Uh, this kind of equipment's been used for many decades by many nations to explore the deep sea. And based on that kind of sampling, we can definitely misinterpret what's going on. <laughs> so there we go. So how do you get down there? Well, you need a submarine, ideally. We did not opt for the Ohio-class nuclear sub. <laughs> and Alvin was unavailable. Uh, this Delta submarine has been used in Alaska. I've used it right here in Gastineau Channel um, and down in the Taku Inlet area. But it only dives to 300 meters, not nearly deep enough for the work that we wanted to do. Um, the bathysphere just isn't very mobile. This is William Beatty's original bathysphere. So we ended up um, using these extremely versatile single-person submersibles called deep worker subs. We also used a CI Falcon deep rated 1000 ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, these big robotic tools that we drop over the side, send them along, drive them from inside the ship. They collect samples, they collect video, and explore while we all watch on the screen. A pretty good tool, but everything you see is what it sees. You don't know what's going on around you. Um, you it's a little more difficult to put things into context. Um, nonetheless, a useful tool um, but 
we took two uh, deep diving submersibles as well, again, so we could see with our own eyes and put the human computer to work in the natural environment. On the left, you'll see uh, the, the ROV going over the side, <clears throat> and inside the pilot, Matt, driving his uh, equipment and, and going on transect, as well as headed out to collect uh, specimens of corals and sponges and other creatures we were looking for. There's the uh, camera. It's got two uh, horizontal thrusters as well as a single vertical thruster. Very powerful, very useful tool. These are the submersibles. There are two subs there side by side. They could both fit right here next to one another. Uh, they weigh about 4,000 pounds. They're battery operated. Uh, they're untethered. Uh, they're about five feet high, about five feet long. Um, to, in order to have a, any successful mission, our dive supervisor was running the show, communicating with our navigator, who's the voice in the earphones, directing us on transect as we're underwater. And of course, the captain of the ship is a, absolutely imperative because the ship, once we're launched and, and dropping through the water column, we must stay within the sonar cone of the ship. If, this, if we're outside of the sonar cone of the ship, we're lost. Uh, it's very, very difficult to recover us, track us in any way. Uh, so maneuvering with a 230-foot vessel was um, pretty key for successful operation. This is sort of what our um, mapping software looks like, uh, tracking submersibles as we go. This is our launch point. This is our recovery point. And then every step of the way, every 15 minutes, we're, we're being tracked and our coordinates are being recorded. And this, this is a really important feature of the data that we collected so that it matches up with the, all the video and samples we took so we can map exactly where we were each step of the way. All right, here's the deep worker submersible. I am all, I'm locked in. Uh, it's got, um, these are battery pods, thrusters. This is a titanium, uh, basically, shell with an acrylic dome and, and a titanium crash cage over the acrylic dome. That dome provides tremendous ability to maneuver and view. You drive the submersible with your feet. Hands are free to operate all the computers and everything else. Sonar, we have our own in, onboard sonar, everything else inside. Um, our hydraulic manipulator, which is right here, is used for collecting specimens. This is my camera, and these are HMI lights. Here's my collection basket, and it's quite a trick to pick up this lever, open the basket door, try and drive the submarine with your feet, looking out through a two and a half centimeter thick acrylic dome, and, and carefully surgically collect delicate little corals, sponges, and other organisms we were looking for. But that was the mission, and that was the tool. Um, this is our submarine pilot team. There are five of us, five submarine pilots on board. and. Uh, ROV owner and pilot, and then the rest are the technical crew that maintain the submarine. After each dive, batteries need be recharged. All the seals are, are uh, checked over and such. Uh, really great team. With that, I want to show you just a few minutes of uh, video clips uh, going down into both Zemchug and Pribilof Canyon. What you're going to see are short clips showing some views underwater and going through the water. You're going to hear several different voices myself as well as the voices of these other pilots and at times we'll be describing some of the things we're seeing, some of the things we're feeling, uh, some surprises and uh, otherwise it just gives you a, a sense uh, for what it was like to be down there eye to eye with some of these just amazing creatures in an environment that was so foreign to anyone, never been seen, you really had no idea quite what to expect. Got a saffron? Yeah? I'm trying to get them fishing. Go ahead.
So this is kind of what it's like. We once uh, <laughs> once you're in, you're in. Get down to the bottom. Takes about 45 minutes. And sometimes you need to wait for the other submersible. What do you need there, Saffron? Um, it's quite cold. It is cold. The bottom of the Bering Sea can be two to three degrees, sometimes colder. Right now, where we were, is below freezing. Yeah. What do you need, Saffron? Here we go. Is that light? Audio? All right. Here we go. Back to the Bering Sea. Out on the shelf edge. Ready to go, John? Ready to go. Submarine or high sign. Down, down, down. This is a moment. It takes about three hours to get to this point. All of our internal checks. Make sure all life support systems are dialed in. Then we get the hook up. And we're in the hands of the crane operator. One of the nicest days we had. Bering Sea is not like this very often. Deepworker 7, you can go ahead and enable uh, thrusters and confirm uh, soft ballast is in neutral position. That's what I said. Oh. <laughs> this is all important. Deepworker 7. Roger that. At this time, Deepworker 6 and Deepworker 7. You have permission to flood the south ballast tank and proceed to bottom. Squid. Copy that. Deepwater 7 proceeding to bottom. Copy that. Proceeding to bottom. Commander squid, most common. Go ahead and turn that volume up if you want. Seem to be battled by the president. Elio, large. Jellyfish, many species of jellyfish in this area. I'm actually, there's a predator on boat plankton. I'm in a sea of crustaceans and ketognaths. Absolutely glorious. This is on Soft bottom. sediment floor, some epifauna, some mollusks, anemones, bioluminescent. Top side, deep worker seven one five two seven on bottom. At this time, heading two seven zero two seven zero. Top side, this is deep worker seven. Uh, letting you know I'm surrounded right now by about. A thousand perch over. Pacific Ocean perch, Sebastian Brutus. This is a blue line eel pout. So many deep water species. Male fishes, like this one. Swimming by the dome, checking you out. Rock fishes, so many rock fishes. Northerns, short spine thorny heads. Look at these outstanding colors. This is um, plumerella. Several different corals and sea whips. This is a trophy sized sea worm in Plectinema. <laughs> of course, you've all heard of the deadliest catch, and this is where it happens. Crab, snow crab. Now we're up near one of the walls of the canyon. And this prow fish has carved a, wall, carved a cave. Inside that cave, I was able to tip the sub down. Didn't get the camera in there, but there are several hundred baby red rockfish in that cave with them. You also see these two red lasers. Those are 20 centimeters apart that we use for measuring organisms in situ. There are basket stars harvesting plankton and detritus. And you've seen a lot of sedimentary seafloor. Now you're seeing boulders and rocks. Any 
of these the believer drops down. Some may be glacial erratic from times in the past. Some may be carried by rivers. But many large rocks are carried by sea ice. Here, they provide that attachment substrate for sponges and sponges provide good hiding for this octopus and many other cephalopods and crustaceans. In the far left, giant barnacle harvesting plankton. We often think plankton, so much of that production is up near the surface. This is over 600 meters deep. There is so much life all the way to the bottom. Very, very busy zooplankton community. That was one of the great surprises. Here's a, that prow fish out moving around, foraging. See in the center there a squid right on bottom. Here's one of the more common species we saw, grenadier. There are three species in the Bering Sea. That was a long fin grenadier. We also saw Popeye and others. Cephalopods making their getaway. Of course, there's, there's 14 or 15 species of skates in the Bering Sea. of a liparid snailfish attached to the carapace of this crab. She's quite likely laid her eggs inside the carapace for protection and adheres to the carapace until her young are extruded live, catches and moves on. So many strategies for it. that That's been observed both in Southeast Alaska, elsewhere in the Gulf, in the Aleutians, and now in the Bering Sea. Black cod, sable fish eating metophids, bioluminescent metophids. Um, again, those little butter balls of the Bering Sea. Any students have a guess on this one? Well, neither do I. <laughs> There's so many things we really had absolutely no idea uh, what they may be. There was, I tried to collect several of those large blobs. They disintegrated. Some people think they could be larvation feeding nests, but they've never been seen that large, so we're just not certain. The gadded family in this area is very abundant. Cod, Pacific cod, like you saw snapping up euphousids as well as pollock. You can see these small pink. Uh, Brittle stars, very, very abundant. Well, aha, here's a very important clue to the methane hydrate I mentioned earlier. This is likely a bacteria called Begetoa. This bacteria can fix methane. This is some of the best slope we've they seen so far. Bacteria themselves like will form this pavement. Hit a rock this outcrop. white, very thick exciting. layer of extruded Ooh, calcium carbonate wow. as they. This is just about vertical here. Part of the process of fixing uh, methane. Doesn't look like it's going to go very high, but it's really interesting. Varies quite a bit. Anemones, we'll see in a moment some extremely high current rhinoids. situations. Now we're going up the wall. You can see the sedimentary layers. Remember the river origins of this canyon? And then you can envision the rivers cutting through and, and leaving these layered walls with rockfish, brachiopods, and durians. And the crinoids are the. Uh, Look at this view. This canyon continues another 60 plus kilometers. Large sessile invertebrates. Sure is steep, but it's actually compacted silt. To the south. Um, still able to stir it up. Short spine thorny head, crinoids, ancient species. And, uh, lots of. Currents are thought like to be extremely body. high, and these walls are an important feature of house for uh, sort of. Shaping the canyon's productivity because yeah, as the Bering Slope Current comes along these canyon walls, it gets compressed. And bit. Dr. Phyllis Stabenow and others at PMEL feel that the currents can um, exceed five, six, seven knots in pulse events. And that helps drive the nutrients from the deep waters of the Aleutian Basin up through the canyon's 
up onto the shelf edge to feed that shallow shelf super productive area. I'm driving a sub here and I am going backwards. This is not an ideal situation. I'm doing about three knots in reverse. Look at the splendid colors down there. And students who are uh, in Mr. Carney's class, you have a question about that. Why is everything tangerine, pink, red? What's going on with light as it attenuates through the water column to these depths? We have so many species of sponge. This is one of the more common hexactinolin sponges. You can see the small crustaceans living in this little crustacean hotel. Again, sedimentary seafloor and these rounded boulders, probably drop stones. Possibly see the small shrimp with this green, this pink anemone, Clibronopsis. These little, little communities all focused around the hard substrate. using the hydraulic manipulator arm to try to collect. This is a very stable situation. It's very challenging on a wall when you're trying to drive and hover. Hydraulics are under tremendous pressure. Nearly 20 atmospheres. Driving it with your right hand. Again, not a very surgical procedure, but we were able to collect quite a few organisms that have never been seen. I mentioned silicon deep in the basin. Sponges are made of silica. Those white calluses, these beautiful sponge gardens are all totally dependent upon high silicon in them. That deep, rich, siliceous waters in the Aleutian Basin being advected up onto the shelf edge you can see we're at about 160 meters here, feeds these sponge communities. And the sponge communities in turn provide habitat for crustaceans and small fishes and other organisms. These black coral staphylococcus, little Nemo of the north. Good color match, possibly co-evolved with some of these deep bright orange sponges. This is a coral. Soft coral doesn't need calcium carbonate in structure. That might be advantageous as the ocean may acidify. Soft corals, anthemastus. Here's another hard coral. And the largest coral that we know that grows in Alaska, Paragorgia. These can be over three, four meters high. This is the ROV arm collecting just a branch of one of the Paragorgia corals. These things are huge and they form these giant red tree groves. See? Yes, very much so. A lot of the shots you just saw were put together by Pat Race and his crew down at Lucid Reverie. Uh, you'll see the video footage and pull a few shots out. <laughs> All right, I'll walk quickly through just some initial findings from last year's expedition. Spent about a year, everyone on this team, as well as many other members of the scientific community have been working on specimens that have been shipped to every corner of the earth, whether it's fishes or uh, corals. All the corals, for example, have gone to the Smithsonian, where Dr. Steve Cairns from the Smithsonian Institute has graciously been working hard to identify the corals we collected. Sponges have gone to sponge experts in Germany. Uh, worms have gone to worm experts, everything is, as well as many specimens are being worked on right here, some in the Anse lab and some uh, elsewhere in Alaska. So I'll touch on some highlights from this expedition. We talked about what our mission was, just a quick review of that, and then a, a summary of what we actually were able to accomplish. We did get in 25 dives in just over three weeks between both Pribilof and Jemshug Canyon. For those of you who have ever been in the Bering Sea, you can imagine we feel extremely fortunate to have been able to um, 
to accomplish that many dives in that much time. Uh, we did have 10 ROV dives, and the advantage of the ROV was that we were able to go down and explore deeper than the submersibles can go. Submersibles max out at 630 meters. That's, that's the depth that Lloyd's of London allows us to go. We know the subs can go deeper, but that's the limit um, for safety. Yeah, exactly. Um, yet the ROV, again, unmanned, can go down to 1,100 meters. Many ROVs, of course, can go quite a bit deeper, but this was our area of focus this time. We did collect quite a bit of uh, video and many, many, many specimens of marine life. Tried to collect one of each so we had um, material to work with for taxonomic purposes as well as for other investigations. This is the area. These are our dive locations in Pribilof Canyon. And I want to remind you, Pribilof Canyon is about 1,800 meters deep down where the axis joins the Aleutian Basin. Our submersibles go to just over 600 meters deep. So we're really just exploring that upper edge of these canyon habitats. And yet, even at that, uh, we found so many um, <clears throat> uh, new environments and new species we had uh, absolutely no idea about. Here's our dive locations in Pribilof and our dive locations in Zemchug Canyon. And again, in this massive canyon, you can see where we were able to explore is only the edge. That's, there's quite a bit here uh, yet to be seen. And just to point out, you've heard of deep sea hydrothermal vents, hot vents. Most of those vents that have been found in the world are quite a bit deeper than we've been able to look. So we'd certainly love to go and explore for that sort of feature down deeper in Zemchug Canyon. All right, um, let's see. Some of the corals found uh, over 13 species so far. Uh, many have been found elsewhere in Alaska, um, primarily in the Aleutian Islands. Some also occur here in the Gulf of Alaska. <clears throat> Means a new record of that species at that area in the Bering Sea. Yes, exactly. And there are many range extensions. Um, some, yeah. <clears throat> got quite a few species for which are range extensions, of course, um, with this kind of data. You, you certainly expect that. Um, <clears throat> we did get some information regarding the second item fishing effects. We did see some sign of humans having been there, and I'll show you that in just a minute. We also, uh, moving down to food web dynamics, gained some incredible new insights regarding zooplankton distribution. What the heck does that mean? All those little plankton, the little crustaceans, the krill, um, and other organisms, in, in particular a creature called ketognaths. We had no idea that these species were distributed so uh, deeply. And you know, many food web models are constructed on you know, primary production in the illuminated layers of the ocean. And then here come the, the zooplankton and everything is happening pretty much at the top. And everything from about 200 meters down, well, it's just, it's just sort of functioning on the leavings of the species that are abundant in the surface. But this is simply not the case in the Bering Sea and in the canyons in particular. Because of the structure, the morphology of these canyons, with lots and lots of current moving around, you know, as, they, as the Bering Slope current goes by, it creates these huge gyres. Everything is mixed up as other currents hit, like, like planetary waves and other currents hit the walls. We get these pulse waves that move material up. And then we have both diel migrations. Many creatures in the sea move up and down to either avoid predators or to access prey every day, called diel migration. And others will move during their lifetime. Some will live up near the surface waters during a particular stages of their life history, like crab, baby crab, live as plankton. Um, many in this room know so much about how plankton, planktonic crab are drifting uh, in, in the upper water column and then, of course, drop down to the seafloor to adopt their, their adult uh, phase and walk around on the seafloor. So they're using all these different habitats. And now, based, based on our observations through the water columns of dropping down and going back up every single day, uh, we were able to see what the distribution of these species look like. And it is actually challenging a lot of the food web models that are, are, um, have been developed for the Bering Sea primarily because the bioavailability of these species was not nearly as well understood. We're continuing to work on the spatial distribution of these patches of 
very rich eagle plankton um, out there. Um, uh, food web dynamics, the second item here uh, listed is alternative energy. So I mentioned petroleum, I mentioned methane hydrate. Well, what do I mean by alternative energy? Back to our food web models that we rely on to predict how much production, how much fish, how much life is there in the Bering Sea, modelers look at the food web and say, well, there might be this much carbon out there in the Bering Sea. Based on what? Based on our traditional models. And that traditional model says phytoplankton obtains energy through the sun and through photosynthesis fixes carbon. We're all made of carbon. Every creature on the planet is made from carbon. Uh, that process from, from sunlight through photosynthesis feeding that food web is what our models are based upon. Our models for the Bering Sea are not based upon any other source of energy. And yet, if you remember those little white patches on the seafloor, those clues to methane hydrate, those bacteria, well, it may in fact be that those bacteria, which have been found in other places like the Gulf of Mexico, are fixing methane and sulfur, perhaps. And effectively, in, a, in addition to the sunlight feeding that whole productive ecosystem, we may also have uh, processes from at the seafloor interface that are also feeding into the carbon budget, that overall production in the Bering Sea. Um, much like back in 1976 when, what, hydrothermal vents were discovered near the Galapagos. Galapagos are very rich. We found these vents near the, near the islands, and here we're the Galapagos of the north and Pribilof Islands. It may be that there are two systems at play feeding, and that might be good news. As surface waters change, as the climate changes, maybe having two sources of energy or several sources of energy uh, feeding into that biological system will be, will be good. It might help buffer some of the effects as the surface climate changes. We had some other clues um, to food web dynamics and its isotopes, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And we had some fun discoveries. Again, we were right at the edge of Beringia, possibly on the beach, if you will, that edge of the land bridge. Humans, other creatures migrating back and forth often go to the edge, the water's edge, to forage. There's protein there. Uh, what forms of protein? We'll take a look at that in just a moment. All right. I said we saw clues of human activity in the canyons, and certainly we did. Look at the top. That's the depth. This image is taken by the ROV. 968 meters. Uh, this is a piece of trawl web. I have no idea of its origin, um, but we did see pieces of web. We saw a long line. Fortunately, none were such that we were entangled, although I was a couple of times, you know, you. you very distorted view looking through the acrylic and you're fixated on these incredible corals and sponges and things you need to do and you know transects and life support systems and get distracted and I found myself looking down at the seafloor at one point laying and I was sitting right on a long line. Well I wasn't so afraid of you know concerned about being hooked or anything but you know when your thrusters are running you definitely don't want to have them sucked up into your props. And that didn't happen, fortunately. Saw a few other signs of human activity in this area. Again, the trawl net, some, you, you can see the furrow here in the soft sediment. Some of these furrows were quite deep, some extended several kilometers. Probably trawl doors, for those of you who aren't familiar with the trawl fisheries up there, the doors weigh several hundred pounds. It's quite massive, whether it's a research trawl or a commercial fishing pollock trawl or bottom fish trawler. Uh, those doors are heavy. And then once those nets fill up, sometimes they'll have loads of 100 metric tons per net load of fish. And that dragging along the seafloor can also certainly have some effect. And that's possibly what was at play here. There were areas where those fan corals and other upright structures um, definitely appeared to be disturbed. We don't know the full extent of it, nor do we know the ecological effects of it per se. Um, but we do know that we have left our footprints even in the depths of the Bering Sea Canyons. I said there were clues to other food webs. This uh, graph, to some degree, illustrates only a clue. Uh, what you see on the, here is uh, nitrogen 15 and, and carbon 13 ratios exhibited. What nitrogen 15 and carbon 13 uh, signatures um, inform us about where a creature is in the food chain. 
how far from primary production or initial production does that creature live? Where is it in the whole scheme of this complex food web in the Bering Sea? And the, and the sort of the group here to the right exhibit a pretty standard ratio. They look like creatures we've seen before when we look at their isotopes. We take a little tissue, um, the university isotope lab in Fairbanks examines the tissue and we get these carbon and nitrogen signatures. This group, again, exhibits a fairly common pattern, but this group does not. That pattern is quite different and it is definitely suggestive of maybe a chemosynthetic pathway, the one, the very pathway perhaps that we talked about when we saw the little seat near the methane hydrates. These pathways have been found elsewhere again and some of this information is corroborated by what people have seen elsewhere. All right, one of my favorite subjects. Um, I collected these dirt balls. Uh, they're about fist size, two of them. I had no idea what they were. They're laying on the seafloor. I get down to the bottom and looking around in Pribilof Canyon and I see several clods laying about and they kind of had a white crystalline glow about them. I just didn't, couldn't quite tell what they were. So I thought, well, I'm waiting for the other sub. I've got a little time. I'll go over and check it out and I collected two of them. Well, as I, when I got them to the surface, I was surprised that they were rock hard. They weren't soft, gushy, you know, sediment at all. They were literally rock hard. In fact, one of them was dropped, didn't even phase it, didn't even lose any, any sediment whatsoever. So I thought, what are these? Well, then I started looking at them more closely. And what you can see up here is there's a little tiny scallop attached. There's this green, strange goo glow growing out of this. And there's some little tiny worms and other bits of shell. So I'm thinking maybe inside there's remnants of the past. Maybe this is something in very interesting. So I thought, well, I'll hang on to them, see what I can find out about this green goo and these little chips of shell. And then I started thinking, well, if they're so hard, I don't really want to just break them open uh, without kind of having a sense for what I'm going to do with it, you know, what's in there. So I went down to Bartlett Hospital <laughs> late one night when the folks that will remain unnamed uh, were not so busy and x-rayed those little dirt balls. And you won't be able to see what I was able to see, but when I saw it, I was totally amazed. Each one of these little x-rays outlines a perfect gastropod, a snail, a marine snail. It's quite clear. You can see the world and everything in here. And I thought, wow, I just couldn't believe it. Each one of these has a big snail in it, huge, the size of a clod. So I thought, well, now what am I going to do? Well, I better call a, a, a gastropod expert. So I called Nora Foster up in Fairbanks. I said, oh, you're not going to believe this. And I shipped them up to her. We slowly pulled them apart and, and revealed a story that is becoming more and more interesting with each passing day. I also took a little tiny bit of the scrapings and sent them down to California to the U.S. Geological Survey. And on the bottom, you see the name John Barron, expert with USGS on very cryptic, non-existent, ice age diatoms and algae. So he had just a tiny scraping of some of this sediment. He put it under the microscope and sent these micrographs to me and up above, he has listed the names of these extinct ice diatoms. Well, that's all interesting. We know there's been diatoms up there. Diatoms have, are really one of the key plankton in production in the Bering Sea. But what was more interesting is that he knows when they live. These diatoms suggest that this layer around this mud was around 12 to 15,000 years ago. If you remember the Bering Sea land bridge, remember that ice age? It was melting right about then. So if, so this was probably right at the edge of the Beringian margin at that time. And based on the depth and location where I collected them, I'm thinking, wow, these snails could have been walking along on the beach edge or in the shallow tide pools while people were walking by. So I started asking around friends who get into this kind of thing, paleoecologists, I said, well, did humans ever have anything to do with these kind of gastropods? Is there any clues? And they said, well, you know, let's check these out. They identified the species. And one is upper right. That was in the smaller clod. It's called Bucinum. And the other on the lower right was the larger clod. It's called Neptunia. Both of these species still exist. They're fairly common, down to about 200 meters, if I'm correct. And as it ends up, there's two more bits of interesting information. These are both found in middens, shell middens, near Dutch Harbor, 
near the Bering Sea land bridge, people used snails pretty extensively in some areas as a source of protein. As they're migrating around and trying to find a new home, um, and they have, you know, during the course of all of human migration, these gastropods, in fact, have been pretty important to humans. If you look at the Smithsonian Magazine two months ago, you'll see a really interesting article. There was a photograph of gastropods in this discussion about human migration and their important role in providing protein to humans for brain development as they're migrating around the planet. So, again, maybe these were there. There's another clue that is emerging. One, this Bucinum on the upper right has been found elsewhere. It's been found in the Gulf of Mexico. And people working in the Gulf of Mexico have been doing a lot of isotope work on it, and they're investigating methane hydrate seepages and chemosynthetic pathways in that area. And this species has very clear linkages and is able to use some species as food that come out of that methane hydrate chemosynthetic uh, environment down on the seafloor. Just getting more and more bits about this. Uh, the National Park Service, who manages Beringia, is very interested in Beringia, has graciously offered to um, analyze both of these shells for carbon-14 dating to see if we can corroborate that 12 to 15,000 year um, dating that was done with the uh, ice out. And that's underway uh, next week, actually. All right, lots of corals and sponges were found, as well as many other organisms. I'm just going to show you a few species uh, that we collected during this expedition. This is a fantastic species of coral, red tree corals, a common name used around here. Um, corals, of course, are colonial organisms. Each single polyp is one animal. And kind of like bees in a beehive, you know, there's a lot of individuals, but they work collectively to build the hive. Well, these coral polyps work collectively, if you will, to build this rigid skeleton. Why would they do that? Well, of course, the skeleton provides a, sort of a structure to distribute them up higher in the water column. That, you know, these are deep cold water corals. Corals in the in warmer climates have zooxanthellae, photosynthetic and zooxanthellae that feed them. Deep cold water corals are quite different. They need to get their own food. They need to have access to food, plankton in particular. So now they're up on this big branching structure and that provides them the opportunity to harvest uh, plankton from the water column. But look at that tangerine on a bronze skeleton. Just, and this is what it looks like underwater, except the polyps are out. Each of those bumps is a beautiful little tangerine colored flower. Just going along the sedimentary seafloor and then boom, just amazing. And then it's not just the coral, it's all the associated species around it that are also fascinating. This is another species, Swiftia pacifica, a very common fan coral. You might see it around here, plumerella. Black corals, bathrocathes, and more primnoa corals with very different um, <clears throat> polyp structures, more angular. And this is just a single branch of that very large Paragordia, common name Kamchatka coral. These things can be huge. Um, and they're, they're, they're not a really hard skeleton. They're fairly flexible. Again, with all the polyps out, they're brilliant, brilliant orange. You can see on here many uh, small polychaetes twisted around the branches of the coral. Um, they seem as if they've, they've got quite an uh, association there and they co-evolved. Hard to say. This is a single polyp on that soft coral, if you remember, the ROV arm grabbing the soft coral, uh, Anthemastus. This is the polyp just withdrawing as it's being collected. There were some very strange life forms down there as well. This is a Stoloniferan coral. It's actually growing. It's not growing its own skeleton. It's not putting its energy into uh, aragonite and calcite forms. It's, it's growing on top of another coral. It's going for a ride. Clavularia. Um, this is a beautiful, tiny, tiny coral. This is about one centimeter high and about one centimeter in diameter. Terophilia alaskensis, a scleractinian coral. Hard. That is a hard. More, uh, more like the shallow, growing uh, corals you'd see uh, snorkeling in warm environments. Why would we take such a photo? This is, um, this is a tip of a, of a coral that's normally upright. 
Isodella bamboo coral. It's called bamboo coral because once all the polyps, all those beautiful orange polyps are gone and dead, the skeleton is segmented. White, black, white, black, white, black, and it looks very much uh, like bamboo. And it's very brittle once it's dried, like bamboo. Um, many species in the deep sea have very important compounds that are being examined globally for medical applications, antivirals, antibacterials. We did collect quite a bit of exudate from many different species. This one just happens to exhibit the classic exudate drip. That was just what we were looking for, very easy to get it into a vial, get it in the freezer, send it off to labs um, to test its potency against human and other disease uh, causing viruses and bacteria. The sea is a, is, it's a, it's a sea of viral particles. So, so many creatures have very highly evolved chemical processes by which they protect themselves, which is why it's been a natural place to look for new, new medicines and cures. Um, here we have eggs of fish species we don't yet know. These are um, ring of eggs uh, adhering to the bamboo coral egg. It's another, well, you can see the color match, and if you, I, to remove these eggs is quite a feat. These things are stuck in a hard rubbery ring around that branch. The species definitely knew what it was doing in working with this particular species, which suggests that may been, uh, they may ha have co-evolved. Um, and then when we see this species, um, this is an Ulfurian, a brittle star, but look at the spikes. This thing is customized for hanging on to those slippery, goopy polyps and was found only growing on that bamboo coral. Of course, we've got hermit crabs, not uncommon to the species around here. Beautiful sponge forms of all kinds, some of which we had never seen. This is a gumo sponge with a teeny tiny sponge called craniella growing inside. I mean, these chartreuse squishy sponges were something pretty exotic. Um, another sponge growing within a sponge. And notice the spicules. These are, you know, you can see the glass house that is the sponge cell wall, that silica. And that all comes from that deep source of silicon in the, in the basin. This is a really tight close up of a leg of a sea star, a very unusual sea star. Anybody know what that is? Anybody ever seen it? All right, very unusual. 11 leg, tiny central uh, part of the body, and then these hollow legs extending out like this. As I came upon this in Zemshug Canyon, I could see it walking across the sedimentary floor. It was very much like this color and very flat. The bright orange walking along, and it looked like a, like a Cirque du Soleil character. Walking along, to, you can see the special appendages out here for spreading its weight out, hollow legs, walking along, foraging. Uh, you only have one view of one leg because my submarine was actually disabled. Um, and I had to come up under some kind of emergency conditions. And in the process of that, I had collected this, this uh, sea star in its entirety, got it in my basket. I was thrilled to be able to examine this species up close. It was a very, very rare opportunity. Uh, but then when I had to, had to surface, actually I got, you saw the squid. Well, the squid were the problem. The squid kind of went through the thrusters and we had a big calamari mess all over the place, and <laughs> it was um, it was unfortunate. You know, I tried to turn. I tried turning off my lights, turning off the thrusters. I tried everything I could to keep out of the squid, but they just kept coming. And it's so rich in the Bering Sea with squid, and they're so important in that in that as a forage base in that area. They're just thick. Um, but squid are soft. You know, cephalopods, soft bodied. They chop up quite fine, but they all have a beak, and I get, in the end, I guess just one too many beaks got in there and jammed my thruster, and that was it. So I had to come up under emergency air, fill the battery pods with air, come up to the surface. And once, of course, as all divers in the room know, once you get toward the surface, air expands at an incredibly rapid rate. And I have a little tiny tube out to dump the air as fast as I can. I could see daylight's coming. I'm shooting to the surface, and I'm spilling air as fast as I can. And I almost got it, but it came up a little hot. And when I did, my collection basket lid flew open. And, I, and I'm, in the, I'm inside the dome trying to get my Bersinget sea star. No. 
Anyway, so just have a leg, and there it is. <laughs> There's the Gorgona cephalic, that's basket star picking food off the surface of a sponge, and many, many, many species of brittle stars in this area. Polychaetes, also tangerine. Ah. I uh, saw a beautiful orange sponge in the distance. I thought, we don't have that species. Well, I want to go and investigate. I got closer and looking in, the, I could see little tiny orange creatures crawling around among the sponges. What is that? It's very difficult to see. I got closer and it's like, oh, look at that. Well, I didn't really want to collect any crab necessarily, but I wanted to try to get the sponge. So I got it. And as I'm closing the arm, I watch as before my eyes as I just crush it. And then I got, so I tried to, I floated a little piece of the sponge into my basket. It was the bottom part, the top of this thing cr cracked off. It happened. It happened. Well, when it got to the surface, they were opening the basket. I saw the bits of sponge. It was enough for taxonomic purposes. And I looked inside, and there was this little visitor. Uh, so, so what species is this, crab biologist? Golden king crab. Maybe 18 months to two years old, I'm told. And it's about as big as a silver dollar. And so in answer to which, did we see any special species associations? Well, these crab and many other species are very intimately dependent upon sponges and some of the other features like bryozoans, other, other, other biological features of the seafloor that create these little habitats. And this is certainly one little messenger of the thing, hey, these be sponges. Well-behaved little shrimp. And you can see the red in its eyes. Uh, there are times it's dropping down to the seafloor. At times, the light from the sub would pick up this huge field of little tiny red dots, and I had no idea what it was. And getting down deeper, you see the entire seafloor was covered with these shrimp that appear to have these bioluminescent eyes, and I was glad to see it still had it even after surfacing. Short-tailed albatross, and a little photo of the visitor that escorted me down to the depths. That was quite a treat, as you can well imagine. Uh, these um, dolph porpoise in Zemtug Canyon circled around my sub at the surface. And of course, I started going down thought they would be departing, and several of them continued to circle around the dome and then shoot up to the surface. And I could see their silhouettes as they got to the surface, went along the surface, got a breath, and then torpedoed straight down to me and just came eyeball to eyeball. <laughs> and they just kept going. And it was, wow, what, a, what an escort to the depth. So anyway, I think I'll, I'll end with that. And, just um, wanted to share a few highlights of the expedition. There's, there's um, much to talk about, so much we saw. There were some things we didn't see. There were species I really hoped to see. Some of the students might be thinking about viper fish. There's also another fish I really hope to see, the deep sea angler fish. Well, Rachel believes that someday I will. <laughs> she says, keep on going, keep trying. And when you see one, bring me the picture. <laughs> So um, there's much to explore. Again, we've only been near the surface of these waters, um, and we certainly hope to probe deeper. We have plans to continue um, this work with all kinds of people that are now um, interested in these canyons and the processes that occur there. Um, so thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, we'll be glad to kick us on. Here we go. We'll start the questions. Uh, oh, no, no, I don't think you can. We've tried. <laughs> Here, wait for this. Yes, I believe you said that the uh, Ice Age retreated about 21,000 years ago and exposed this area. Is the belief that this canyon was formed in less than 20,000 years, or did that Ice Age stop that development that had occurred much before the fir that Ice Age? Um, great question. Um, actually, no, the canyons were not formed subsequent to that last ex uh, maximum extent. There's been about 18 ice ages occur in that region over the last several million years. 
and it's believed by geologists who study this extensively that, that it was during the multiple events that the Yukon, Anadir, and Kuskokwim rivers flowed over exposed land off that edge of the North American continent and continued both with water as well as with all the sediment that rivers carry scouring out these canyons. Um, so their formation was over many, many Ice Age events. And subsequent to the Ice Age events, they're underwater and actually the canyons appear to be expanding, both possibly through just sloughing, sedimentary sloughing, but also there are a number of biological organisms at work. You saw many of them, you saw some species that are bored in, there's boring worms, boring clams, other creatures that are boring into the walls, and then you get these strong water currents flushing out the sediments and the can canyons continue to grow slowly, but they're growing. Thanks for the question. Yes, Skip. For the rivers to cut out that amount of earth, wouldn't the ocean have to have been empty so that they could scour it out? Or can they scour it while it's full somehow? Um, well, Skip, my understanding is, is it is, was a the water flow itself, but also a lot of the sediment that those river systems carried, um, and all the sediment that went off the edge and scraped it down. There have been um, there have been several people that I've spoken with that believe that the sedimentary processes were a major player, and that's all underwater. Do you have plans to go deeper with a submarine that can take you at deeper depths than this particular depth that you went to? Um, certainly hope so. Uh, I went to Hawaii last year, met with, um, I worked with the Department of Oceanography at University of Hawaii. Why? Because they have deeper diving subs. <laughs> <laughs> they have uh, the Pisces submersibles. They're three-person subs. They go quite deep, um, down to 4,000 meters. Remember, the bottom of the basin, 4,000 meters. The mirrors subs, also owned by the Russians. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the mirror subs that place the flag under the ice. Um, yeah. In fact, I was in Pribilof Canyon, the first human solo submarine dive in the Pribilof Canyon. Come up from the surface, we get a satellite back, says, oh, guess what the Russians just did? <laughs> we thought, oh, yeah, we went down to this big canyon. Well, they were down to 4,000 feet planting the flag. So the Russians have the mirror submarines. Um, University of Hawaii has the Pisces submarines, and then the Japanese have the Jinkai submarines. So between those, we're hoping to get some of them here in 2010, and there's a lot of momentum in that direction. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my question is that when you were talking about the methane hydrate and the alternative energy, yes. um, do you think they're using the methane as a form of energy, some of these creatures, just like... Uh, when you're talking about the chemosynthesis. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's, that's what um, could be at play. We know that there are methanotrophic bacteria and other species that feed exclusively on methane seeps emanating from methane hydrate in now Cascadia Ridge off of the coast of Washington, uh, as well as other locations. And the clues we have suggest that that may be the case. Would it be similar to what uh, in the, uh, I forget what those things are called, that they found with the, the hot vents, they were using sulfur as a source of energy as right. a, in the same way that you, you think these creatures are using methane? Um, <coughs> it's possible that species in the Bering Sea may be using sulfur as well. They're not hot, mm -hmm. likely, but cold. But yes, um, using it. Uh, using the methane uh, for energy to fix carbon or using the sulfur to fix carbon rather than photosynthetic processes. And I have another question. In the submarines, how long can you go down there before your oxygen and electricity run out? Ah, well, oxygen lasts quite a long time and electricity doesn't. Um, you've got about eight and a half, ten hours of battery. Depends on how much, how active you are, how much current you're fighting. Um, we have four days of oxygen. We have oxygen tanks, and then, of course, we're also somewhat limited by what we exhale, right? We maintain one atmosphere inside of um, the submersible, and we maintain atmospheric, uh, we attempt to maintain atmospheric oxygen levels, which for students, what is that? 
think David knows, 21.8%, 20.9%. We try to aim for that inside the sub, um, and that helps, yeah. It, and so with that, we have about four days. So if we ran into unfortunate circumstances at depth, there are submarines available within four days from Russia, from somewhere, <laughs> we hope. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have another limiting resource that's, you know, our, the scrubbers. We have chemical scrubbers that remove the carbon dioxide we exhale. Why? Because we need to make space for the molecules of oxygen to come in. We have to get rid of that, that uh, carbon dioxide. So scrubbers can be a limitation, but in general, we're set up for about four days if absolutely necessary. Again, the temperature, two, three, maybe four degrees. So you're in for a chilly ride. Yes? When we talk about largest or deepest, um, what percentage of the ocean floor has been mapped and how much do we know at this point? Exactly, really good point. In fact, what do we really know about these canyons is another question, which is you know, we don't even have high definition mapping of these canyons. We don't have multi, what's called multi-beam mapping, we find scale mapping, we may find they're larger than we think. They're probably at least as large as we've reported thus far. Um, you know, the ocean is what, 75 to 80 percent of this planet, of which less than one percent has ever been seen. More of it has been explored through various means, through mapping and other remote sensing tools. A um, more, little more than one percent perhaps has been studied, but so little has ever been seen. In fact, 80 percent of the planet is deeper than a thousand meters. Most of the habitat on this planet is the deep ocean. And with regard to our little ocean here, the Bering Sea, we've not even seen what is down below that depth. So we really are just trying to get clues from the surface and keep working our way down as we go. So we don't know much, hope to know more, but it takes uh, a lot of effort. Uh, as everyone may know, we have no home ported submarines in Alaska, you know, the most oceanic of states. Um, I'd sure like to see us, you know, invest in some submersible technology, ROV technology. Um, I think that would certainly help us better understand these systems that definitely that feed us as well as the world protein, that's for sure. Well, to, to follow up on that then, what is it that you called these canyons at the beginning of our lecture? And I mean, there was some superlative term. Largest? Largest. Largest. Zemchug is, is uh, by far the largest uh, known on the planet. Of all the, the world's oceans, again, 75, 80 percent of the planet, about 4 percent of that are considered canyon features. And of those canyon features on, you know, in planet ocean, Zemchug is far and away the largest. There's one canyon that's longer, a couple that have a couple holes that are a little deeper. But in terms of the sheer scale, over 11,500 square kilometers drainage area and 5,800 cubic kilometers volume, it's massive. And that was the, the, the diagram I showed, try to compare some of the other larger features on the, on the Earth and then exceeds them by, by quite a bit. So, so you can say that with confidence that it's... Zem, Zemchug, yes. And Zemchug, by the way, is pronounced Zemchug. It's Russian. It means pearl. Again, this was a very rich fishing ground for the Russians before that Shevardnadze line was drawn. Black pearl, the big black hole that produces so much fish. So the Russians named it Zemchug Canyon. And yes, um, I, I feel quite confident that in the geologists who tell me that they've looked into this quite a bit. And every report is that it's by, by and large the largest um, by any measure. Did your uh, findings on this expedition lead you to um, believe or, or contemplate that uh, we should be managing this area differently? Managing the area with regard to fisheries, with regards yes. to anything in particular? Exploitation. Dick? Exploitation, harvest levels. Well, um, you know, when you've there's certainly been an effect of our presence in with fisheries, uh, both the, the extraction of 
the volume of material we take out of that area. But most importantly, I, I suppose, and having visited especially Pribilof Canyon, the next canyon over from Zemchug, where we spent about our first week, um, what's very clear now is that Pribilof Canyon is located just below those super productive islands, again, called the Galapagos to the north, the Pribilof Islands. And many physical oceanographers and others now feel that those islands are enriched largely by the presence and proximity to the canyon. And so we have these islands up on the shallow shelf edge, what was formerly Beringia. And we have canyons off the slope. The canyon is feeding, especially the eastern branch or thalweg of that canyon, flow, carries nutrients and productivity right up to around the, the Pribilof Islands and feeds that area. And it's that connection between the deep water and that that the canyons provide for especially a place like the Pribilofs that makes me think perhaps we shouldn't be fishing that area so extensively. If you look at any fishing chart, that area is heavily fished by trawling, long lines, and other fisheries. And what it's doing, if you look also now at populations of seabirds, mammals, even fish and crab around the Pribilof Islands, you see one trend. It's this. And so if you know, if you're obtaining most of your nourishment from the deep waters through this conduit, these pipelines that are the canyons, and feeding the Pribilofs, and you cut that off between the, in the fishing depths, say between 100 and 400 meters that fish heavily, you're kind of cutting off the umbilical that feeds that region, and perhaps um, that area should be reconsidered for different management. At the moment, there is no protection whatsoever along that entire shelf edge from fishing. So I... I think um, after seeing what I've seen and uh, working through the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and looking at all the extraction and activities in that area, I think that some areas of the shelf break, especially some areas of the canyons, probably should be protected as a precautionary measure to preserve that ecological function that feeds the entire upper half of the Bering Sea Shelf and the Chukchi and the Arctic. That seems like a good place to stop. Thank you so much, and, and thank you, Michelle.